This conference will now be recorded. God bless you. We greet you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. So grateful to God that he allowed us to see this day, a day that we've never seen before, a day that we'll never see again. We thank God for his loving kindness and his tender mercies. God is great and greatly to be praised. Bless each and every one who have decided to gather this morning uh, as we study together God's word. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you. Oh God, we thank you. Uh, because of who you are, because of who you are, we give you glory. Because of who you are, we give you praise. This morning, we look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. We realized this morning it was not the alarm clock, O oh God, but I know it was the touch, O oh God, of your hand, O oh God, that allowed us, our eyes to become open and us to be uh, more present in the land of the dying on our way to the land of the living. So God, we thank you. We thank you for another uh, Saturday uh, day that has been set aside for this uh, body of Christ to come to study, to show thyself approved unto you. Oh God, we realize that, oh God, we can't do nothing of our own, but we ask for the aid, the comforter, oh God, to come, the Holy Ghost to come and open up our understanding, purge us, uh, from all sin and unrighteousness, O oh God. Create with us a clean heart, renew the right spirit, guide us in the way you be the teacher, O oh God. Open up our understanding, O oh God, our spiritual, give us spiritual insight that we may, O oh God, see more than just our natural eye, O oh God. Pray that you allow the jewels, the pearls of the, the holy writ to be, O oh God, unfolded and revealed unto us. Help us not just to be hearers of the word, O oh God, and repeaters of the word, but help us to be doers of the word. We thank you tonight, this morning. Oh God, be our help, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, we thank you for those that's here, and we thank you, oh God, for those that's on the way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, heaven smile upon you. Uh, as we come this morning, we are so grateful to God to allow us to gather just one more time. Amen. We want to recognize our superintendent of Sunday school, our sister Deaconess. Amen. Let's let's be the first also to recognize our, our superintendent. God has given her more work. Amen. It's stretched her a little further and a little wider. Amen. Our deaconess, Catherine Hill, who serves as our superintendent of our Sunday school. And to all the uh, facilitators, we thank God for our director of Christian education, our sister Brenda K. Foreman. To all the other teachers who serve in the teaching ministry at Greater Central and all those who work along with us, amen, you know who you are. We say bless you this morning in Jesus' name. Thank you for your prayers uh, in my absence, uh, but we do, do know that uh, we were in good hands between our sister uh, Foreman and our sister Joni Durant Sparks and all those others who have joined in to help to carry the teaching ministry uh, this day. So we're here this morning to share the word of God with you. I'm going to, if I have to uh, leave a little early and turn over to the hands of our superintendent or maybe some of the others uh, to close out I'm here at the church this morning, uh, we have a, a, a funeral service for, uh, we're working along with the Isaiah Owens Funeral Home and we have a the access to uh, render service. So if I cut off a little bit early, uh, you can carry on and, and until you come to the closeout. I'll be gonna try to, uh, myself, about 10.45 or so because we have 11 a.m. service. But nevertheless, we're gonna share uh, as our lesson uh, give uh, outline. And we thank God for you, you and you, all our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. This morning, we're talking about responsibility of those called. Responsibility of those called. Amen. We have 12 verses. We're in the book of James. Amen. The book of James in the New Testament. Way in the back of the book, in the book of James. Amen. We're going to be reading chapter 2. 
And I encourage all believers that you need to take time and, and so much meat in the book of James that you just need to take time and, and just not just read it, but study it if you want to help yourself become developed. Amen. You want to develop yourself as a believer, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a great book because this is a book for maturity, to be mature. You want to grow up in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is a great book, very practical, and it tells us how to grow. Amen. To be mature. Amen. In, in Christ. And so, brothers, uh, we have 12 verses. I want to ask someone to come on the line. I need two readers. And I can get someone to read verses one through six. And then the next reader can read from verses seven through 12. If we get two readers. Amen. The first reader, read verses one through six, including six. And the next reader, uh, verses seven through 12. This lesson is taken out of the NIV version of our uh, different uh, uh, readings of the scripts. So we have reading from the NIV, the New International Version, yeah. translation, different translation. Can I get a reader this morning? Trustee Lewis, my brothers Bless and you. sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand here or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves? and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they, are they not? the ones who are dragging you into court. Thank you, Sister Amen. Trustee Lewis. Thank you. Is there another reader? Can I get someone to read verses 7 through 12? Okay. Are they Bless not you. the ones who are naming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really, if you really Keep the royal law found in scripture. Love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker. For whomever keeps the whole law and yet stumble at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but who commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Praise the Lord. God bless you. We thank you uh, uh, for the reading of our scripture this morning and our golden text, our key verses. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world? to be rich in faith, to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him, James 2 and 5. Uh, to open up our uh, lesson, uh, get an understanding of who James is. Or, uh, James, because there's a lot of James uh, in the Bible, especially New Testament uh, writ. Uh, we know that there's James and John. They were the sons of Zebedee. They were apostles, amen. We know her, we always hear about James and John, but this James in particular, the writer of the book of James is known to be identified as James, who is Mary's son, the half brother of Jesus. This is the James we're talking about. And very, you know, when you look at 
uh, Jesus' ministry, not too much was written about his brother. He, he didn't believe in him. Uh, truth be told, of, of, he didn't believe. He lived with him for 30 years. And, you know, he was, Jesus always, he was older than his brother. So he lived with him in the household. And then when Christ began his uh, ministry, uh, earthly ministry around age 30, for three years, three and a half years, his brother didn't believe in him. You know, he had no honor. You know, people were calling Jesus the Christ, all oh, the Christ. And to James, his half-brother, he was just Jesus, his brother. Amen. He, he might have seen and heard, but he didn't have understanding of, of who Christ was. And that just lets us know sometimes we can be around people and don't know who they really are. You can live with them and don't know who. He only knew him in the natural, but he didn't know him in the spiritual. Uh, but say something, we ought to say, but, amen. He became a believer in Christ uh, after Jesus was resurrected. Amen. And to prove that, uh, I see Sister Cunningham is on the line. Thank you, Sister Cunningham. I, I, there are some scriptures I just want to share to let you know who James was. So if we have our scriptures, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 7, we talk about this same James, who, how he got to be, he began to know. Uh, uh, chapter 15. And we look at verse number four down to seven. From four to eight. First Corinthians chapter 15. We can start at verse four and go down to verse eight. And Sister Cunningham, can you read for me? Uh, good morning. God bless you. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cyphus, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until this present time. But some are fallen asleep. Now here's the highlight verse, verse 7. After that, he was seen of James then of all the apostles. Uh -huh. And what last of all, uh -huh. he was seen of me also as of, as of one born out of due time. Yeah, so the apostle Paul let you know he, he had an encounter with him. So in verse uh, seven, uh, he was identified, uh, James, uh, his brother, and he became a believer. Amen. When they saw his resurrected body, he uh, James became, his spirit was quickened, and then, of course, on the day of Pentecost, amen, he was there, amen, in the upper room. James uh, became brothers and sisters, would you believe it or not? Sometimes they said the last would be first and the first would be last, but, you know, believe it or not, James, after Pentecost, you know, the headquarters of the, the New Testament church was in Jerusalem, so James became you believe it or not, the leader of the New Testament, of the church at Jerusalem, you know, the apostles, the other 12, they went out, was setting up, but James was, he stayed basically at headquarters in Jerusalem at the church, and he became ultimately uh, the head of the church or the, one of the great leaders of the church at Jerusalem. So it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, it goes by age or how long you've been. God can use you right where you're at. And, uh, James, when you look at the book of James, he's writing uh, to the Christians, uh, he's writing to Christians of Jewish descent, all right, who are of the diaspora, 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 uh, diaspora that's what the best way to put it, diaspora, and that is uh, people who have been scattered among the nations, diaspora, that's the best way to pronounce them, who have been scattered among the nations. Brothers and sisters, you know who James is writing to? He's writing to the Jews. Jewish, uh, but and we, to let you know who he's really writing to, he's writing to the church. He's writing to the church. Whenever you see certain words in the scriptures, it pertains to brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, so here it is in the first verse, my brothers and sisters, uh, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So he's writing to the church baptized believers he's writing to the disciples the followers of jesus christ amen uh he was writing to the folk that go to the church who, who who's a part of the temple 
the synagogue, amen, who are of the Jewish descent, amen, those, because, you know, the transformation was that they had to come out of the law of Moses, because the, the law came and through Moses, by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, so he was writing to those who would first convert, amen, and so now he's trying to encourage them. Now, it is believed by certain theologians, many some theologians, that this book of James, even though when you look at the placement of, of, of the, where the book is located, don't be so much fooled by how it was placed according to the, the, the Septagon, the Jewish Septagon. They're the one who formed and placed uh, the different uh, books. But it's believed by many theologians that the book of James was the first book written in the New Testament. Uh, and so when we look at the book of James, I just want to share this with you for our Bible study readers, that of the 21 poor uh, epistles, and what is an epistle? Uh, let, uh, epistle is letters, we know, letters written to the church by various authors, right? And so that's what epistle is. Amen. So uh, of the 21 uh, epistle, epistles in the New Testament, 14 are attributed to by Paul, and seven what, are what we call general. And so of the seven general epistles, the book of James falls into that category. Amen. Uh, and as I said before, the book, this book may have been even been written before the four gospel books were written. And that's for us mm -hmm. to debate, but uh, we are talking to the earliest Jewish uh, uh, believers, amen. You know, when Paul came on the scene, he ministered to the Gentiles. You know, when Jesus, uh, he gave his uh, uh, instructions. He said, I want you to become disciples, a witness of the me. You shall be witness of the me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part, amen, of the world. So the gospel is for everybody, amen. But he's here dealing with the Jewish uh, believers. Uh, there's some things I want to uh, point out uh, in our lesson plan. Uh, there are, and it's really talking about favoritism. You know, there are various places that we as human beings may have and do show favoritism. And I'm going to define what favoritism is. You know, I'm going to kind of highlight the lesson real quick. Uh, favoritism, uh, the showing of special favor, treatment, showing of partiality. Uh, favoritism is the re recipient of being a favorite. It's a un the unfair practice of treating some better than others. And brothers and sisters, we found out that uh, favoritism can cause problems. Now, in verse one in our lesson, uh, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. And so this is a, a, a command or, or, or admonition. Now, you know, uh, I want to say something here about uh, this lesson in the book of, of uh, James, the book of James. Uh, it's about, it's written to, for mature people. Amen. Let me get that right. Uh, the book of James, it's about uh, growing yourself, amen? About uh, knowing, uh, becoming mature, amen, amen. Not only is, the, is becoming a mature Christian, we know you have to grow, you can't stay where you're at. We, we know that we're in the babe stage and then we grow, amen. So as believers, there's just some things that we not only have to believe, but we must practice. So let me just, I'm going to share this with you. Not only is the mature Christian patient in testing, but he also practices the truth. All right? And uh, your practice, how you conduct yourself. This is the theme of James chapter 2. Immature people talk about their beliefs, but the mature person lives his faith. How you live it, all right? And it says here, hearing God's word and talking about God's word can never substitute for doing God's word. Amen. So, you know, this 
book the mature Christian. Amen. This book will grow you in your conduct. Amen. You know, there are three things a believer, a Christian, a disciple must have. He must have faith in God. Uh, he must have fellowship. You cannot make it by yourself. You need fellowship. I, I pity people to, who stay home or stay away from the body or the gathering and think you got enough to make it by yourself. Amen. There'll come a time that you're going to be by yourself. But when you have opportunity to come together, you better come together because it takes strength. There's unity and strength. Uh, but also the third thing that a believer, a disciple, a Christian must have, you must conduct yourself. How do you conduct yourself? The call. How do the call conduct themselves? So James here is talking to the mature believer. He's going to grow us. Amen. You must not show favoritism. And so as we just decide, we de define what favoritism means, right? The unfair practice of treating some better than others. To, to show favoritism means to be one-sided, partial. Amen. To show prejudice, discrimination. Uh, uh, and I said that uh, in favoritism, uh, uh, there are various places that we can, as human beings, may have and do show favoritism. We might as well be honest. We have our favorites and we have our certain people we may honor above others because we're human. You know, this shows, this lesson shows the human side or the human practices, uh, we cater to our senses. We cater to our eyes. We cater to our sense of smell. We cater to our sense of hearing. We cater to our own understanding. We cater to uh, things that's appealing. Amen. It seems as though we grasp to that in the natural. But here in this uh, book, James is trying to say, don't be led by the, the natural eye, but be, he's trying to show us to be led by the spirit. Amen. Because when you're led by the spirit, you won't be too quick to show favoritism. You won't be so quick to prejudge. Amen. All right. And we make the mistake. But he's talking to church people. I say, I use the term church people, but he's he's talking to called people, called out people, amen. How we ought to conduct ourselves with dealing uh, with all mankind, but especially, you know, uh, those who are connected, divinely connected, because if uh, you don't have particular persons, and I'm gonna give you some scriptures on that, about God is not a respected person. So who you are, your conduct, how you ought to so treat all men, okay? And so, but never as disciples, we may have favoritism in, the, in our families and friendships in the workplace among our neighbors, but never as disciples or baptized believers in Christ should we show favoritism, uh, especially to those of the household of faith, the house of God, amen? And it's, it, it, he said, must not show favoritism so this should, should not quality or character should not be even be attached to you as you grow all right i said as you grow i'm not saying that you're going <laughs> is easy then in verse two through uh four he gives illustrations uh illustration of 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 showing favoritism okay he gives an illustration uh of showing favoritism and this is what we might call the rich man poor man this illust illustration uh so our sister jerry trustee jerry uh she wrote she li she listed she outlined the illustration she said james says suppose a man comes into your meeting all right or your spiritual gathering uh, he says meeting maybe your sanctuary uh uh, uh, your gathering place when you come. And you know, brothers and sisters, this is a, a, a good lesson uh, or for teaching session for do the doorkeepers, amen. Those who are initial uh, first responders, those who receive people who come into the household of faith, 
this is a good outline for teaching and training for doorkeepers, our ushers, you know, because they're the first uh, line of defense in our households of faith. And they're the first one, they're the, they give the first impression to, it didn't say if this man, uh, they give two illustrations, suppose a man didn't say whether he was saved or unsaved, amen, but he's a human being, amen, comes into your meeting or say, let's say your congregation, your, your sanctuary, wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. That's one illustration of a man, right? And a poor man, and filthy clothes also comes in if you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you have, and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Amen. Uh, and so it tells us here, brothers and sisters, that uh, this lesson will cause the believer not to prejudge people based on their outer appearances, uh, but treat all, especially those of the household of faith, with love, respect, kindness. We as believers uh, are ever in debt to love all mankind. Treat all. Uh, you know, uh, Sister Cunningham, you know, we as human, even church, godly connected people uh, can make that rash decision. I, I like for you to pull up Sister Cunningham. Let's go to the Bible in the, in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse number seven. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse number seven. First Samuel chapter 16, verse number seven. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward, outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. <laughs> Amen. For the Lord, but the Lord looketh a, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So brothers and sisters, uh, if we are not, we should not be guilty to prejudge a person based on what their initial appearance, whether we may, they might be impressive looking. And look at the illustration that the post, I mean, uh, James give. He said, well, because he looks good and he has rich clothing, He's pleasing to the eye. eye. Let me come and give him preferential treatment. Let me uh, escort him to the best seat in the house on a place that would be satisfying. Amen. All because you don't know anything about the man, but you prejudge. And, and that person could be the devil in disguise. Amen. But yet you're going to uh, say to the poor man, Amen. Uh, because of his uh, his his clothing, maybe because of his appearance, uh, but not and you're judging the person for uh, for not who they are, but just how they their their appearance, and don't know anything about who that person is. So you're going to treat them with what disdain. Well, look at the comment he said. Stand here. So you didn't even offer him a seat and if you do offer him a seat you sit at my feet so what i can keep an eye on you but to the fine dressed person or the person you assume uh uh is somebody then you sit them up front and and that can be the biggest deal let me share something with you about making uh i put this in my notes in our ministries and this is basically in verse number six let me look at, jump down to verse numbers. I'm going to get back to verse five. But you, listen, let's go to verse five. Listen, my brother, my dear brothers and sisters, because he says the church, when he said brothers and sisters, or you see the term brethren, he's talking to the saved. He's talking to the church people. Amen. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? He promised to those who love him. 
But look at verse six, but you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? And I just want to give you uh, some real talk. And sometimes in our ministries, we uh, lift up the wrong person based on what? Academics, based on uh, their appeal, based on looks, based on fine speech. And these be the, the main ones that's killing you. Amen. Who, or who will devour you, who will destroy you physically. Amen. Rob you blind. And you know, sometimes we, I, I make this statement, I, I heard it stated years ago, and it's true. You know, strangers will celebrate. Let me say that again. We have, we make the mistake in our churches, households of faith, of celebrating strangers. We'll celebrate a stranger, stranger. those uh, we are idolized and we'll lift them up on pedestals uh, because we think they're famous and renowned. Uh, but there's, that's someone you, who you celebrate, and I find this to be very true, uh, is very likely to care very little about you or I or your own situation. The same people you celebrate uh, be the same one who care very little about you or your situation. So we'll celebrate some, but then the poor, the one that we don't think highly of, or we maybe look on despise and disdain, we tolerate them. Amen. Amen. You'll celebrate a stranger, but the one you know, you'll tolerate. Amen. You'll treat them a, with a certain amount of disdain. You'll treat them any old kind of way. Uh, you won't give them fair treatment or adequate attention or honor. Uh, but that'd be the main person. That'd be the same person who will love you unconditionally. And so, brothers and sisters, we have a, you know, when I look at the lesson today, it causes us to pray for spiritual discernment. Spiritual discernment. You write that down because we're so quick to judge. Judge. And that's a dang, dangerous thing, brothers and sisters, when it comes coming to judge. Uh, what did Jesus say about judging? Huh? What did he say about judging? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. Amen. Let's go, Sister Cunningham, uh, judge. Uh, let's go to the book of John, uh, chapter 7 and verse 24. There's two places I want you to read. We're going to read verse St. John chapter 7 and verse 24. And then I want us to look at St. Matthew chapter 7, 1 and 2. So let's look at St. John chapter 7, verse 24. Can you read that for us? Okay. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Read that again. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That's it. That should be in red in writing. In that red. Jesus yeah. is talking. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Amen. We ought to cast, we will cast judgment. Who are we to judge? And can you read St. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1 and 2 since we're talking about judging? Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measures ye measures, it shall be measured to you again. All right. So that's St. Matthew chapter 7, uh, verses 1 and 2. Amen. St. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1. We have to be careful not because a lot of time we misjudge. Amen. We misjudge. And and what, look, what, look what James is saying. We'll exalt. Those with fine apparel, smell good, look good. Amen. We'll exalt them. Amen. And disdain. But James is really trying to get us to see when you look at verse five, it's, it's those, the poor. Listen to my, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor 
in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. I love to use some scriptures. Amen. Uh, St. Matthew chapter 5. Amen. St. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 3. St. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 3 simply says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor, the despise. When we think about uh, uh, the poor, you know, uh, we're not just always talking about uh, uh, physical, uh, the financial portion, but there are some people that don't have, but he, Jesus, chose the things of low uh, estate that we consider low so that he can come in that route because he was a man of sorrow acquainted with grief he was born in a lowly estate amen that he can exalt amen so that's why sometimes you hear that god opposes the proud but he gives grace to the humble you know if you're humble he can bring you up but guess what when you high <laughs> amen uh, uh god really can't use you amen when you're leaning on your own understanding god can't use you amen but he he chooses the low things amen of humble a state of a state of mind a state of being that he uh can exalt and since and since i i use these scriptures about the poor and the ultimate example is when we look at christ uh sister cunningham i'm just giving the scriptures of uh, isaiah 53. Can you read verses 1 through 5? The prophet Isaiah will give us a perfect example of the poor, of those of humble estates, humble of beginning. Amen. Isaiah chapter 53. We've heard this. It should be a highlight in your Bible. The despised, the those that disdain. Amen. And look what he's able to do. Oh, look what he did for us. Isaiah chapter 53, 1 through 5. Can you read that? Who have, yes. Who have believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him like a tender plant and like a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. All right. He now. is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Mm. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and chastisement for our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All right. So we see how the route that he came, amen, amen. He came uh, in the humble beginnings, amen. And he was, prof that was prophesied. We know that when he was born, his family didn't have much. His parents didn't have much. There was not even uh, room for them at the end, amen. Uh, he came in humble beginnings, but he was our Lord and he was our savior, amen. And so uh, he said, you exalting the wrong person. And, and that's truth be told, we get people to come in and they really dog you because you think, because they have so much to offer that they look good. Be careful how you appeal to your senses. And this is not just in our spiritual walk. This is in our, how many of us have been, just been fooled? You just been fooled, amen. You 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 cleaned after or uh, 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 you, you went after, you know, someone, that you thought was something and, and really he wasn't or she wasn't and they be the main one that do you harm amen we and the ones that you overlook <laughs> have mercy lord amen that be the main one for you all right okay so look what he says here i'm a hasten he says they're the ones that in verse seven are they not the ones who are blaspheming the normal name of him to whom you belong amen in other words he's saying that uh, instead of these people that we think are supposed to be like-minded in faith and 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 and, and spirit, these are ones that uh, almost dig ditches for you, and they are like the wolves, amen, in sheep clothing. So don't just 
don't, let's not be so quick to show partiality. That's what I really want to stress to you. Uh, don't be quick to uh, making quick judgment and distinction and giving preferential treatment one above the other based on outside general appeal. Uh, but treat, uh, uh, but it's how we treat and handle and respond to people. Uh, that's what uh, we got to give an account for. We want to be able as believers to treat, handle, and respond to people uh, the same. And as I'm a close, and the same is by using, in verse number eight says, keeping the royal law, the royal law. Amen. Keeping the royal law. Amen. Well, what is the royal law? The royal law is to love. Amen. Everybody. Amen. The same. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That is the royal law. Amen. Treat everybody right. We sing that song. I'm going to treat everybody right. I'm going to treat everybody right. I'm going to treat everybody right in my heart. Amen. So utilize the royal law. Uh, and then uh, you, you, you'll be able to uh, uh, give the love, respect, and kindness uh, uh, that's due to all men. And there's just something about uh, the responsibility. You know, we are supposed to be doorkeepers who attract people to God, to the household of faith. And so we have that type of mindset of showing partiality and uh, being judgmental about how we're going to handle certain people and not all people. You know, uh, there was a thought I had that in Proverbs said, he that desire a friend uh, must first show himself to be friendly. So that should be our demeanor to all who enter, amen, into our setting. Uh, and I, I did write some notes down here. And, you know, uh, what I put here, treat people as you desire to be treated. Uh, be kind to all men. That's what the royal law is. The royal law is to speak to all men. Uh, and, and here's the question I want to leave put in the atmosphere. Do you greet people easily? Or are you comfortable walking by without speaking? Do you, are you entreatable? Some people are not entreatable. You know, we, we I know we might be thinking in this setting about just coming into the household of faith, but how do you treat people in general? Are you in are you welcoming? Do you have that type of disposition to welcome people? I mean, uh, you know, a civil servant, uh, when you uh, work for the public, you have to uh, have what you call public relations skills, whether you know them or not. That's what I'm trying to say. Do you have that type of spirit? And sadly, some people don't. There are some people I know who are absolutely comfortable. And if they don't know you, they won't even look in your direction. They won't even smile. But when you got something on the inside, you're going to treat everybody the same evenly. You're going to be greet, you know, have a, a spirit of greeting people. You know, there's sometimes the difference uh, you find northerners versus the southern southerners uh that the, in the south as for some for the majority i would say people kind of greet you they at least speak and say good morning or not they acknowledge you amen it's a terrible thing when people just don't acknowledge but up here in, in new york the northern part people gonna walk right by you don't even acknowledge you amen and so you know uh we are as believers we're supposed to have this spirit of being able to greet people uh, uh, to love and to show love, to give them the, the royal law, uh, which is uh, the law of, uh, 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 of love, amen, without showing uh, 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 partiality. And that word discrimination, you know, it's terrible to be on that, when we talk about that poor man that have to sit on the floor, poor man that have to be treated indifferent, and we, I know in our lesson plan, it talks about the Irish, amen. I don't know why they use the Irish because we as a African people of African descent, amen. I don't know why the writer of this book chose them, 
especially if we're in the, the what you call Black History Month, if anybody know about discrimination, if anybody know about prejudice, uh, uh, if anyone knows about being unfairly treated as a norm, amen. And, and let us not get carried away. Yes, we as a people have come a long way, but they have just, it's the same scenario. They just changed the, the way they uh, people in power treat us, amen. There's a, a Jim Crow, then there's Jim Crow Esquire, amen. They, they just changed their dynamic, but I believe that the people are still the same. Amen. And my one thing my godfather was telling me about prejudice, he said he come from Alabama. My godfather was the late uh, Richard Phillips. I'm just kind of generalizing this and I'm going to turn it loose. And I'm going to ask Sister Foreman and maybe Sister uh, uh, Durant to kind of conclude for me. Uh, and then we'll turn it, you can turn it over to the hands of our superintendent. But one thing, and our lesson uh, follows up with this, that he said discrimination he said he come from Alabama and, the, and he passed on, but he was born. He said he dealt with prejudice. People who treated uh, black, uh, black people in an unfair manner. Then, you know, over the years, you know, you could come up with laws and you can write laws to kind of prevent uh, people from being treated unfairly. But laws is just in place. But until they change their hearts, and that's what our lesson is really was talking about, you can get all the laws in place that you want to kind of prevent uh, uh, favoritism and discrimination and unequal treatment. Amen. But unless a person changes his heart, amen. Thank you, Sister Kim, even oppression. But until your heart is changed, you know, people ain't going to change. So really to have a, the heart of Christ, Amen. Is to love and treat those on a fair basis. Now you you'll find out who's for you because most of those people are going to give themselves away in their actions and their conduct. And sad to say, many people are bruised. Amen. For judging wrong, and you have to deal with people as they said, a man in fine uh, clothing and a jury. You know, someone who seems to be outstanding and appealing. They're the main ones that would do you harm, amen. But uh, we are still supposed to, uh, we're duty bound. The debt that we have as believers, that we are duty bound to love all men. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy mind, soul, and strength, and to also love thy neighbor as thyself. We was doing that the other night, amen, treating, amen, by this all men, shall know that you are my disciples, that you have loved one for another. Amen. And then uh, just be careful not to show favoritism. Amen. Because favoritism, and, I, and I'm definitely done, you know, you can cause favoritism in the family. And favoritism cause problems. I'm going to end on this one. Sister Cunningham, can you uh, uh, read for us Genesis chapter 37, uh, verses 2 through 4. Let's go to the first book. And I'm going to show you what favoritism would do, because that's what a, this is the most of the part of our lesson is about. Favoritism, the dangers of favoritism. Genesis these, chapter 37, verses 2 through 4. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilal, <coughs> with the mm -hmm. sons of Zephah his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his fathers their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. All right. And Joseph that drank the drink. Okay. No, that, that's it. That's all we need to hear. Thank mm -hmm. you. Jacob, who is Israel, his name had been changed. They said he loved his son. You know why he loved Joseph more? Because Joseph was the first born of the woman whom the wife of whom Jacob loved. He loved Rachel. And so uh he showed that love. He showed that faith. Them other brothers was uh from Leah, first wife, and the concubines of Zelpha and Billa and Zelpha. But when Rachel, the one whom really Joseph loved, finally gave birth. But he showed favor and it caused problems. Amen. Showing favoritism will cause problems. Amen. And families showing favoritism. Amen. Will cause problems. Amen. So we're not to show favoritism. And last but not least, 
uh, you know, uh, as pastor, you know, I don't want, I ask uh, my, I said, you know, here come a, a renowned person or a renowned preacher. I'm not a respective person because God is not a respective person. I'm just going to put this in the atmosphere. But and when a minister or one man or woman of God come into the sanctuary, maybe after the service has started, you know, I instruct my ushers just because they're a minister, you don't escort them right to the pulpit. Amen. You sit them down. Amen. And wait till I acknowledge them or wait till I'm informed that there is a man or woman of God, a minister, pastor, whoever is in the house, in the sanctuary. And after I acknowledge them to either be brought up or to let them remain. Amen. And truth be told, most pastors, like myself, if I go out to a church, I'm not looking to sit in the pulpit. Amen. Some people, pastors, preachers, we know them. As soon as they walk in the door, they, they feel themselves. They, they need to be escorted. <laughs> Amen. I tell you one thing about Great Essential. We are, most, we are one of the most humbling places. <laughs> Amen. You're fine. And all of our churches, are, I don't care what your title is. Amen. Amen. But uh, wait, just don't bring somebody up, amen, because they have the title minister. If I want them as the pastor to come, if I'm informed, I'll give directions, amen. Some folk, they just need to sit where they are, amen. And you know, <laughs> I know some things that you just don't know. But here it is. God is not a respect of persons. I'm going to leave you with that. Uh, we're going to ask them to carry on. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 17. Acts chapter 10, verse 34, and then Proverbs 28, 21. God bless you. Amen. If God is not a respective person, a person, who, who are you and I, amen, to judge? Uh, Sister Foreman, Sister Durant, would you kindly fill in for me and then turn it over to the hands of our superintendent? God bless okay. you. Thank you, Pastor. Um, we thank you for the lesson for this morning. I have two questions. Um, here is an answer from an Alexa Answers contributor. I'm sorry, Alexa answering me, and I didn't ask the question yet. Um, are you aware of your own personal biases and prejudices? And the other one is, have you ever felt that you was the subject of someone's bias or prejudice? And how did it make you feel? One, are you aware of your own personal biases or prejudices? And two, have you ever been the subject of someone's um, bias or prejudices? And how did it make you feel? Anybody? Hi, uh, Sister Brenda. Yes. I, um, as a matter of fact, I mean, that this is a good, um, talk to talk about is something I'm going through right now and it's at work. And um, I think I mentioned it before um, with one of our directors and um, we are now with, with Black History Month I had and I challenge, I asked the Holy Spirit to lead me and how to approach this. And um, it came to, for us as the few Blacks that's in that particular department to come together and we're going to meet um, because he is, and I use the word, I don't use it loosely, he's an oppressor. And, you know, um, it's not easy, you know, to work underneath someone like that. But I just thank God for guiding me to humble myself for the Holy Spirit to guide me and how to approach it. And the first thing I had to do was go to my manager because most of us, we won't say anything. We just sit there and we endure it. But I'm right underneath in the middle of it. And, you know, and I'm not talking about this happened yesterday or last week. I'm talking about this just for maybe over a year or so. And he had came and took over. So, um, yes, I, I'm in the midst of that right now. And um, I'm just thankful that God has humbled me to, to seek him and how to move forward with it. Not only for myself, but for the five or maybe eight of us that's within that department. Very good workers, very good techs, um, lab assistants, and we should not have to endure that. So this is the second time I brought it to my manager. And I said to her, I said, I'm going over to HR. And she called me and she said, oh, 
um, I think it's something that we need to talk about. So we did speak about it. And I gave her a, a, a verbal, and this time was email written. So I said the next time, but I didn't go, but we had a conversation. And so now we're going to meet, and she said she's going to speak with him. I said, because we don't want to be working under those hostile environment. Um, it's a lot of work that we're there, you know, working in the lab, you know, dealing with specimens. And um, we want to make sure that everything is done decent in order. So, you know, um, I'm just staying prayerful uh, for God to work that situation out. He doesn't speak to us. He walks by. You say hello to him. He doesn't. And that's not a big deal for me. But it still creates uh, an, an uncomfortable and hostile environment for us. And I don't normally or, or actually always call the race card. But in this case, I am. Um, so um, that's why, I, you know, I use the word oppression. And I don't use it loosely because I could even can't even imagine what our ancestors went through back in slavery, because that's what they were really oppressed. And we even experience it now in this century, 21st century. So thank you um, for sharing, for me sharing that. Okay, let me ask you a question. Does um, this experience, um, how can I put it? Does this experience that you're having right now uh, cause you, um, how does it cause you to treat other people in light of how you're being treated? Oh my goodness, Brenda. Um, I, I'm humbled. I, I, I when I even when we look at the other cultural, um, ethnic backgrounds within the lab, um, and they are treated differently. And 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 it's one of the things I have brought up. So I just make sure that I don't have any discord against them because of their favoritism treatment towards them as opposed to us. So it caused me to really examine myself and make sure I don't oppress people, anybody that I meet whether I know them or not. And I've always been that approachable person anyway. But if, you know, someone doesn't want it, then I back off. And and I just ask God to, you know, open up my eyes, you know, take the skills off to see that person through his eyes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a work in progress. I, I freely admit that. Uh, I don't like being treated a certain way. So I try my best to treat people uh, fairly, you know, as, as much as I possibly can. And when I see something that I've done wrong and you, you approach me and you say to me, well, Brenda, you said such and such, I didn't appreciate that. Or you treated me this, this way, you know, I have no problem apologizing to people. And I think that's, uh, where we have to look at when we're in leadership, how we treat people under us. Are we uh, treating them with a dictatorship? Are we showing favoritisms to them? Because we're talking about leaders, you know, those that are called and what our responsibility is as leaders. Um, so we have to be careful, you know, that when we do see that we're doing something, you know, that we, um, correct ourselves or we make that amends and we be fair and looking at us just as we look at others you know how they treat you and you know and i tell you i'm a work in progress um there are a lot of times that i'm very quiet and i observe and i don't say much you know but i'm also crazy enough that when you treat me wrong i call you out on it and i've done that at work I've done that in public, you know, now the thing that I can work on, and I'm talking about me, the thing that I can work on with me is my response and how I call them out. And so if we're saying to ourselves that we don't show favoritism to certain people at some times, or we lean heavy on one person and you have others there, uh, we're fooling mm -hmm. ourselves. So we have to be careful as leaders uh, and be responsible as leaders, you know, to treat God's children, to treat God's people, because they're not your people, they're God's people, you know, and so that how we treat them you know, matters. You know, I give an example. I remember I was at a restaurant and I had been waiting a long time uh, to be seated and some dignitaries came in the door and they automatically run to them and they gonna seat them. 
that they were going to seat them. I'm like, excuse me. I've been here waiting for such and such a time. Um, I'm supposed to be seated next. And he said, but yeah, but they're assembly so-and-so and and, uh, president so-and-so. And And I'm like, I know who they are. You know, so that's what I mean by my response to how I respond to certain things. Maybe I could have said it a little bit better. So I'm just saying we need to be honest with ourselves and how we deal with people, especially as leaders, the people in our ministries, you are not their dictator. You are not their ruler. You're someone that was there to to guide, you know, to lead. Um, And so as leaders, we we need to be um, careful of that. Sister Joni, you have anything you want to say before we turn it over to Deaconess Hill? Yeah, I'll do it real quickly, Brenda, real quick. Mm -hmm. The scripture says the eye of the Lord are in every place, beholding evil and good. We are to honor all people. We are godly people. We're not in the streets. This is a spiritual journey that we're on. And that's a practice that we have to do within ourselves. But we have to honor because God honors everybody. He said all souls are his. So we have no right to discredit anyone. Yes, I've been mistreated, but it's okay. Because God got this thing. We have to honor each other and not play favoritism, you know, and we do it unconsciously and we do it consciously. We have to love one another. Thank you. Okay. Deaconess Hill. Yes, praise the Lord. Thank you, Brenda. I keep one thing in mind with this particular lesson, responsibility of those called first I look at myself when we are about to take communion and the word says, examine yourself. Some things have happened to me in the sanctuary. I'm not going to be long on this, but um, I talk to myself a lot. And I was saying to myself in certain situations, did I do anything? First, examine yourself. Because God did not leave us the law to judge. He said he'd be the judge. But one thing he did say, he said to love others as you love yourself. And I do truly believe that we love ourselves. And we don't want to harm ourselves. We want good things to ourselves. We want to look good and do good. God didn't make us the judge after he had gone back to the Father. And he has no respect of a person. And we're not all of that. We're just servants. The ones that are are in position, don't let it go to our head. We don't have the big head. We're just a servant of the Most High God. And it's a privilege, an opportunity to serve him. And don't forget who put you there. You were put there and you can be taken down. So I thank God. I thank God every day, all day. Okay. And after that, I just want to thank the ones that have continued to donate to the church school through Givelify. And even those who don't donate, it's okay. God knows your heart and your finance. He knows that too, what he allowed you to have and what you don't have. And I always say you can't give something that you don't have. So therefore, prayer is always in order. And also, you can give by give a side uh, too. And you can get the envelopes from our ushers on Sunday morning uh, if you want to give in person, which is a blessing. Also, we have a few books left uh, for a donation of $10. And I believe we have roughly six more months to go in our books. So if you would like to pick up a book on Sunday morning before service starts or after uh, morning service. And we are also still wearing 
our mass in the sanctuary until the COVID committee informs us otherwise. And we just want to thank you. Thank you for your obedience. Thank you. Brenda, you have any more remarks? Yes, I just have one thing I forgot to mention. On this coming Thursday, Thursday of next week, the um, Congress of Christian Education of UMBA, the United Missionary Baptist Association, will be having a virtual workshop. Intimacy with God is your mind mm -hmm. stayed on Jesus. And our very own Minister Patricia Graham it will be one of the preachers for that session. Um, and her topic is a mind is a terrible thing to waste. So we're asking those that can and will, if you would register for this uh, workshop, it's a free will offering. There's no registration fee. You can get the information off the screen or get the information tomorrow or see Minister Graham um, and let's support her um, as she goes forth with the word on next Thursday, it will be online. And so you will have to log in on Zoom um, to be with the session. And if anyone needs to know how to get onto Zoom, you can contact me um, by Wednesday. I won't be, I'm leaving Sunday and won't be back until Tuesday. I'm going to the retreat. So you can see me on Wednesday um, to get, how to get onto Zoom. But let's support Minister Graham. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Um, Deacon, mm -hmm. I, I just yes. want to say that I heard you talking about COVID, and I just want to yes. say that COVID now is like a cold, running nose, yes. maybe running, and, you know, throat ache. So I'm just saying to the people, like, if it gets too heavy on you, you should just check it out and see yes. if COVID or the flu. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Some information that we needed to know it may seem like a cold, but it's best to have yourself checked out. Okay, um, now we will be reading our prayer on page 215. Father, may your Holy Spirit teach us to see those who walk the earth with us as you see them. As we do, deliver us from the sins of partiality, prejudice, and preference. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Start to remember, God doesn't play favoritism, doesn't pay favorites, and neither should we. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you. Pray to see you tomorrow morning service, 11 a.m. God bless. Thanks.